I am Praveen Swami. Uh, welcome again to this week's edition of Crosshairs, the program where we tell the world's leaders how to fix the problems of the planet. Um, just joking, how we unfortunately just talk and try and explain the big national and regional security crisis uh, uh, dogging uh, our part of the world. I'm speaking today with Dr. Ajay Sani, the director of the Institute of Conflict Management and uh, perhaps India's smartest student of all things to do with insurgencies. Um, so I'll get straight to it, Ajay. Four weeks into, uh, four months, excuse me, into the conflict in Manipur uh, and fighting still going on. Eight people dead over the last uh, three days uh, for cookies, for maites. Uh, armed gangs taking pot shots at each other on what were described as buffer zones. Uh, the CRPF and the Assam rifles had created between the two communities. Uh, what is going on? It seems quite extraordinary uh, that a conflict could drag on like this. I mean, this is after all not partition or some uh, you know civil war. Uh, yet the killing goes on. Well, if you keep uh, putting oil over the flames, uh, the killing will keep going on. Even today, we are hearing continuous dog whistles uh, from the people in power uh, to the Maiti community. Uh, the chief minister has repeatedly repeated, very recently, I think the last couple of days, he again uh, made the claim that the entire problem was the result of a demographic transformation uh, of the uh, uh, hills uh, due to a cookie influx from uh, 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 Myanmar. Uh, look at the data, look at, there, there, is, there are no numbers given for this kind of an allegation. Uh, what we have seen, even from official sources, are the last official number that was given was about 3,000 cookies had entered. Uh, right. Uh, displaced okay. by the fighting, uh, by the, the fighting civil war taking exactly, place in Myanmar. In Myanmar. And uh, even if we say that, all right, it's, it's much larger than that, it's not 3,000, it's 7,000, it's 10,000, it's 12,000. I mean, it is nonsense to speak of this as a demographic transformation. You look at census data. The Kuki population has grown uh, uh, in percentage terms. Enormously, both the Kuki and Maiti populations have grown enormously. But in percentage terms, the balance remains the same. It used to be about 14%. It is now about 15%. To be said, right. demographic transformation uh, in, in this kind of a context, I can only see it as a, a direct uh, encouragement and provocation uh, from people uh, uh, at the highest uh, rung of power in the state uh, to the Maiti community to uh, take uh, things in their own hands. Uh, Ajay, I'll come to the question of why, you know, you, you said add fuel to the fire. Uh, and But one of the things that's also stoking the, the fire, as it were, is this enormous conflict, uh, looting of firearms that happened early in the conflict? Uh, all sorts of estimates three and a half, four thousand, five thousand weapons, many of them sophisticated uh, uh, modern automatic weapons, uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition, uh, mortar. And yet we're not seeing in the Imphal Valley, which is where the bulk of this looting bulk of took the looting place. Was, yes, yes. Uh, we're not seeing any concerted effort to get those weapons back. Uh, surely, uh, even if the local police is complicit in our national security infrastructure, there are means for the army or other forces of the state to be taking on this role? Or is that a, a fond misconception I have? A fond misconception. Uh, the army and the central forces take the role that they are uh, assigned. And uh, the right. uh, central forces have been uh, uh, removed from the uh, valley areas. And these weapons, uh, as you say, I mean, there has been no uh, significant or concerted effort to recover these weapons, apart from uh, putting up those silly drop boxes, which is the most absurd thing I've ever heard in any conflict zone in my, uh, you know, other protracted engagement in uh, uh, studying these uh, issues. Uh, it is very obvious that there is no effort to recover the weapons, certainly from the valley areas. Hmm. It is impossible that such a large quantity of weapons would be circulating and would not be known to the local intelligence and police. So if they are given direct right. orders, 
an overwhelming proportion of these weapons would be recovered. But there is no intent and therefore there is no recovery. And as long as you have such a large numbers of weapons circulating in a situation where you have so completely polarized communities and then you have watered this whole thing with blood, so the hatred and the rage is not going to subside very quickly. You will keep on having these cycles of, of uh, violence. Uh, you will have a few days without uh, trouble or with lesser troubles. And then you will have a small explosion somewhere. You will have a small uh, uh, engagement somewhere else. And this will continue as long as it is intended to continue. Please understand, I repeat this again and again. This is not happening in spite of the forces. It is not happening in spite of the state. It is happening due to the state and its actions. Indeed. So I'm going to I'm going to draw you out on that proposition a little bit before, but I have a question before, also on the mechanics, if you like, of the violence. Uh, no less than uh, the chief of the Assam Rifles complaining yesterday at a press conference in Shillong, uh, yesterday that is Friday. Um, that there's very little they can do because every time they try and move into one of these areas where there is active conflict, very large mobs, uh, in many cases involving very large numbers of women just move in and swarm the security force personnel. Uh, and there, I mean, his, he didn't say it, but he seemed to say that uh, uh, the forces aren't equipped to deal with this kind of uh, confrontation by large numbers of people. Now, one of the things we used to say about ourselves, uh, in fact, a fascinating note by M.K. Narayanan meant for uh, uh, Mr. Gorbachev at the, on the eve of the fall of the Soviet Union uh, has just, you know, surfaced, uh, which tells us a lot. We used to pride ourselves on being able to control fairly large mobs with a relatively minimal uh, use of force. Uh, to see a force like the Assam rifle say, hey, there are lots of women blocking the road and we don't know what to do about it. Uh, not a great advertisement for Indian law enforcement or the system. Uh, I, I would disagree completely. The Assam Rifles is a counterinsurgency force. They are not equipped with lathis and they are not equipped with tear gas and they are not equipped to engage with crowds of uh, unarmed protesters. Even if those protests at some stage get violent, they haven't been. They've just been obstructive. But they are not... They... This is essentially a paramilitary force meant to deal with armed violence. And the only instruments available to them is are, are guns. They can open fire. Now, are we to recommend that they start opening fire on uh, uh, protesting women? I, I'm afraid nobody is going to take that call. No officer is going to make that call. So unless there is armed violence uh, coming from the other side, aside, uh, the arm, uh, this particular force is not equipped to handle this kind of uh, uh, obstructive behavior. You would and have the to central reserve police force, which seems to be having very similar problems. Because of this, told... RPF, you see, every deployment is different. The CRPF is there in a counterinsurgency role or to confront armed violence. Consequently, they are also equipped only with those instrumentalities. They have not been equipped with uh, uh, the instrumentalities of non-lethal engagement. The only group that is equipped for that uh, kind of a role is the uh, Manipur police. They will have the equipment, but they are, uh, I I'm afraid, uh, uh, compromised. They will yes, not it seems control the bar by in, uh, irretrievably divided on communal lines with uh, Cookie and Maite personnel. Uh, just, have been completely uh, separated. They've, they've gone back into their areas of dominance. They are not on uh, uh, duty where uh, they were supposed to be. The Maitis have moved to the valley. The uh, non uh, the Cookies have moved uh, uh, into the hills. To put this all in a bit of context, there was a time in the 90s when you and I used to discuss these things and I was reading uh, just last night through old issues of uh, Fault Lines, the ICM magazine, which uh, actually those of our readers who are really interested in uh, national security, I commend to you uh, because of the big names, some of them regrettably passed away, who you'll find uh, wrote there on contemporary conflicts. 
Uh, and one of the fascinating things to me was that even in the 90s, there was real concern that Manipur was ending up like a second Punjab or a Kashmir. It, you know, the insurgency had deteriorated uh, to the point where uh, things were going to be unfixable. Uh, that was true not only of Manipur, but of some uh, nearby states like Tripura. Uh, Nagaland was in a mess. And through the 2000s or the 90s, a lot of effort clearly uh, built in to bring things back from the brink uh, yeah. to the point where, you know, violence declined. Are those very hard-won gains now being imperiled? I mean, surely if you have uh, several thousand guns floating around uh, the countryside, uh, at some point that means, you know, uh, uh, an insurgency of some kind or another. Let's uh, put it very simply. Last year, there were seven insurgently insurgency linked fatalities in manipur that was the you, may, you could say the index of the gains that we had uh, seven so this is just seven. zero seven from zero seven from hundreds every year down to seven fatalities this year we are already touching a hundred and all these fatalities are post uh, uh, this these troubles post uh, may 3 or or about right. yes, there may be the occasional one uh, earlier and these have been mostly ordinary people attacking each other. No, 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 training. no, these are insurgency linked fatalities. These are not the current engagements between communities. Fascinating, that's, fascinating. That's a separate figure of about 180 uh, fatalities in these direct communal engagements, including firearm uh, use. These are insurgency linked to the extent that particular insurgent groups have been identified as being responsible for these killings. So are we going to have an, a resurgence of the insurgency? We already have it. Now the question is, can it be contained? Absolutely. This is not, again, I keep on saying this again and again, this is not a security uh, challenge or a security issue if the politics was clean. If the political leadership and the state leadership sought to resolve the problem. It could be resolved. The problem of violence. Can the Maiti Koki problem be resolved? My answer is not for the next 20 years, given what we have done. Given the trajectory right. the past four months, there is going to be so much hatred and polarization that this is not going to be resolved or there is not going to be an effective process of resolution other than effective separation of the communities. So you're going to look for administrative structures which will keep them apart. The whole idea of an integration of the population, the whole idea of a what we would actually call a peaceful resolution, I think can be That's just a long way in the way, future. Uh, yes, it, it, it's now a long way in the future. Uh, four months ago, it was not, or at least not six months ago, it was not. That's when your whole cycles of provocation begin. And then of right. course, for so your your uh, violence actually uh, uh, explodes. So I'm afraid no resolution is possible now, but pacification is possible. The separation of the communities into uh, accepting blocks is possible, but that is possible only if these dog whistles stop. Only if the state acts as a constitutional state in service of both, or rather in service of all communities present in the state. So I'm, 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 a, little, I'm a little skeptical about this because we've never seen uh, politicians behave that way. I mean, in Punjab, you know, one of, I'm, I've never said it's the only one, but one of the factors was uh, the cynical uh, manipulation of electoral competition between the Congress party of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi uh, and the Akali Dal, uh, uh, and uh, you know the, the use of these extremist elements in that uh, very sordid electoral competition. Um, we in Kashmir again, the rigging of elections, the bringing down of governments, the toppling of leaders, all played an enabling role in eventually uh, creating these crises. And we've seen those in the northeast uh, at 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 various points. Um, Yet some of these crises uh, eventually did get solved because political authority at the highest levels uh, decided that the costs 
to India uh, of, of these problems was just too high and something needed to be done about it. And by accident or by purpose, uh, good people were found uh, and means institutional means were found. Uh, why do you believe that in the Northeast, having won those gains, a uh, political establishment is willing to put them at risk. And after all, what's happening in, in Manipur today doesn't affect only Manipur. It has consequences uh, for the Nagaland peace process. Uh, it has consequences or resentments for Mizoram, which is one of the you know earliest insurgencies that was settled in some way. Uh, and I would assume that if it goes on unchecked, it will have consequences for Assam, the uh, mother of all these problems, if you like, of, of these uh, ethnic conflicts. Uh, why do politicians not seem to think that they, 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 they these fires that have been set uh, are dangerous for them all or that the chance is worth taking? Well, uh, you, you see, first of all, Manipur is so remote, so small, it doesn't seem to matter in the electoral uh, calculus. As you say, Manipur does not just affect Manipur itself, it affects a much larger region. That much larger region is all of India. In another sense, that is the objective. You are intimidating, victimizing a minority community. That's the message that needs to be sent across the country. That the minorities had better stay in their place. Otherwise, things will happen. And that is the essence of this, of, of the messaging of this violence. Also, I, I think, uh, you know, you say all these other problems have been resolved. None of these problems have been resolved. Every one of the problems you spoke of has simply been contained. Right. And it's kind of hanging in limbo for... Hanging some, in some limbo for years and decades. What has happened is the security forces have at some stage been given a mandate. And they have done what... They had to do. In other words, containment of violence. And that is the achievement of the security forces under a clear mandate. As far as the political processes are concerned, you, you speak of Kashmir. Are we moving towards a resolution of the problems of Kashmir politically? I would no. uh, uh, very strongly uh, suspect that a uh, similar process of compounding the issues is ongoing, not with the same consequences. Nobody has allowed anybody to go and loot 4,000 or 5,000 weapons. And I repeat, allowed anyone to go and loot. There was right. no violence involved in the looting of these weapons. There was no effective opposition by the guarding forces <clears throat> present there. No, I mean, one of the remarkable distinguishing features of Kashmir was it, at the height of the peasant jackery or, or you know, peasant revolt that followed the killing of uh, Burhan Wani. Mm -hmm. uh, weapons were looted, police stations were attacked, uh, but the security forces held together and made sure it did not get out of hand uh, beyond a point or fought back. And that's possibly because at the political executive memories of what happens when Kashmir uh, breaks apart was still fresh. The educative effect of 10 years of savagery uh, was, was was still influencing political behavior. Uh, unfortunately, in Manipur, that does not seem to be the case. I, you know, I wonder how many hours were spent at the MHA discussing Manipur prior to the outbreak of these uh, hostilities. And I suspect the number may not have been very high. That That's actually part of the problem. As I said, Manipur is too small, too far away. It doesn't seem to matter. The population is uh, not very large. Uh, it, it's, uh, again, not something that affects, I, I think, the number of members of parliament is uh, three, is it? Or, or something? Three, uh, yes, something like that. Negligible. So in, the, in that kind of political process, it doesn't matter. Uh, if it burns a little and it serves a certain political messaging, uh, it's okay. It's an, it seems to be uh, to the powers that be an acceptable cost. Look, let's be very clear. Uh, in four months, there has been no serious effort to contain this violence, either by the center or by the state. The state continues to fan the violence, the state government, 
the leaders of the state government, let me uh, keep on amending the uh, language there, uh, continue to fan the violence. And the uh, center appears to uh, continue to maintain what I would describe as a mystifying silence. Hmm. As if, well, uh, in fact, whatever little they have said has been in support of the chief minister, that he is cooperating. I don't understand this. The chief minister is cooperating. What does that mean when he is constantly making statements to fuel the fire? When he is unable to impose any kind of order, despite the significant disposition of central forces, what do we mean by the chief minister is cooperating? I, I, I really don't understand the, the language that is being used or employed, other than to say that there is implicit or tacit approval of the processes ongoing. So yeah, final... The Indian state cannot be unable to contain this violence if it was willing to contain this violence. So a final question for you, Ajay, and I, I want to widen out uh, the picture a little bit. We're speaking on a weekend uh, headed into the week where we're going to have a G20 summit and uh, there will be considerable talk of India as a regional uh, actor, an, a, an aspiring uh, global power. Uh, there will undoubtedly be uh, talk about uh, China and the, the comparison will be made with China. And one of the things I uh, uh, always read with some, uh, some depression or some anxiety, you know, uh, wonder is how China, which like us is a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious, uh, multi-linguistic society, uh, despite its strains in Xinjiang and in Tibet, doesn't have insurgencies flying. Um, now, that may be uh, because of sheer brutal force. Uh, it may be because of skillful political manipulation, the co-optation of elites, buying off uh, the right segments of society. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, China's growth to, uh, uh, into a great power has come on the back of a protracted period of internal stability where it has uh, dealt with multiple challenges. Um, should India take internal security more seriously uh, if it really wants a place at the global high table? This boring, tedious business of policing and maintaining order. Well, first of all, China is no model that we can, uh, uh, we should or can imitate uh, for a whole range right. of reasons. First of all, resources. The mobilization of resources by China has been amazing. Its growth has been amazing. Uh, it has actually dealt with most of uh, uh, the, the overwhelming proportion of its po uh, population. Uh, there is no significant poverty there. Uh, the dissident groupings or the minorities who are seen as trouble, potentially troublemaking have been contained by all means available, including the excessive use of force, their, their uh, gulagization, you know, the, 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 you just pick up entire... So these horror stories one years years out of the internment camps uh, uh, for what you call re-education. So China is no model for India, both in its positive growth, where we seem to be nowhere in, in uh, competition, and in these aspects of how it has uh, uh, managed its internal security. We have very good models of management of internal security within India if we were willing to apply them. You just mentioned all this G20 and uh, you know uh, how the world's attention is focused on us. You know, very happily, the world doesn't give a damn about what's happening and isn't very aware of, uh, if you see the international media, it's not as if uh, Manipur is making headlines all over the world and these... Mm. Uh, uh, great leaders who are coming to India are very well aware of the uh, 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 you know contours of uh, what is happening in Manipur right now. Uh, I think they engage in extremely crude real political dis discussions over here. Uh, we have already uh, created these Tomkin cities. Uh, you, you know, we uh, prettified little parts of uh, the areas where they will be uh, uh, traveling. They will be presented with uh, across, I don't know what, 60 cities or something like this. Uh, where uh, yeah, uh, Most, most, most of that has happened. It's uh, your city and my city, Delhi, which still yeah, has... Yeah, we've uh, seen, yeah, the, 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 city, the, the parts of the city that they will not be seeing. 
Yes, I, I think it's so, safe to say that. So it's, it's very easy to create this illusion for a few days uh, uh, where you have these meetings ongoing in the very small uh, geographical areas where they will be allowed to circulate. So I, I don't think uh, uh, this constitutes a, a image issue as far as the government is concerned. Now, should we be investing more in uh, uh, security? Well, we should be investing more in security. We should be investing more in education. We should be uh, investing more in technology, in, uh, in research and development. Uh, you talk about China. China now accounts for 23% of global uh, 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 research and development spend. We do not even account, account for a point percentage of global yeah. spend. Uh, uh, research and development spend. So uh, if we had a leadership that was really concerned with uh, national strength and national growth, not just GDP growth, our GDP growth is, is a illusion. It is not based on technological evolution. It is not based on industrialization. It is based on the services sector overwhelmingly. It is based on primary extraction and export out of all these these hundreds and hundreds of uh, whatever they call these startups, uh, which have uh, reached a billion plus or something like that, there is not one that is a uh, what you would call seriously research and technology based. They're all service sector. They're all trading uh, uh, portals. They, 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 uh, their, their capital is a few hundred or a few thousand lines of code. That's it. That's right. So, I mean, I, I think it was Karl Marx who once said, you know, Marx was an awful ideologue and prophet, but he was a, a smart observer of uh, reality. And where he said that the thing that was going to really change India, and he was talking, of course, about the coming of the British, uh, were things like roads and railways, because they would have a far larger transformative effect uh, than, than the coming and going of mere empires. Uh, and I, I, I think that's a lesson we've forgotten. Uh, I always uh, welcome these sessions with Ajay because I go away deeply depressed and pessimistic about the future, but also with a few kernels of uh, unpleasant reality to think about, which usually guides my thinking. And I think our uh, listeners will find it a very useful conversation too. Thank you for always, uh, as always, for joining us this weekend on Manipur, Ajay, and look forward to having you back again on uh, the depressingly uh, large range of subjects we have to talk about. Uh, thank you and have a great weekend. <laughs>